Um, Indeed, I'm very, very happy to speak to you today. Um, I want to talk a bit about the work that you've done in various positions across the, across the globe. What has the experience um, that you've had in so many different institutions taught you about the opportunities that Africa presents? And what do you still feel are the biggest challenges that the continent faces to be an equal voice on the, you know, when it comes to the global stage? Thank you very much for this opportunity. Well, working across the world, I realized that there's so much ignorance about Africa. Um, in agriculture and food, for example, Africa is naturally endowed for excellence in this ecosystem. And we are a contributor to the world's food ecosystem, but this is largely ignored. Um, so one key message that I have taken from my global experiences is the level of ignorance about the continent, the level of misinformation about the continent, and our role in changing that narrative, um, our role in actually getting information out there. That's first. The second is that we still face significant infrastructure gaps. Electricity is just one example where 600 million households are energy poor on the African continent. Now, when you don't have energy, it affects your livelihoods, it affects your economic opportunities, obviously makes the cost of doing business higher. Um, so we have to fill these infrastructure gaps in energy, roads, um, connectivity, uh, data, to really enable the continents to stands shoulder to shoulder to all the world regions, especially when it comes to the cost of doing business. Hmm. And then the third key thing is around leadership. And I've started a number of organizations in leadership because I believe that we have some very, very strong leaders on the African continent in the private, public and nonprofit sectors. But sadly, repeatedly, we see a political class still dominated by an old guard. Um, many linkages to some of the colonial powers, to the military regimes, and these individuals continue to hold us back at, in the political landscape. Thankfully, there are young, dynamic leaders emerging in the private sector and the public sector, but we have to address the challenges in the um, political landscape because they are paramount to addressing an enabling environment for the private sector and the nonprofit sector to thrive. So for me, that remains a huge issue on our continent that we cannot ignore. Mm -hmm. And finally, climate change is an issue globally, but Africa faces the brunt of the climate challenges, even though we're not huge contributors to the problems that have emerged in the world, but because of where a continent lies, you know, seven out of 10 of the most affected countries by climate change sit on the African continent. And so this is a looming crisis. Uh, we're facing droughts and flooding. And unless we have political will, um, combined efforts across the globe to address these challenges, many of our countries will continue to suffer. Um, so these are the issues that keep me up at night, but they're tremendous opportunities in spite of these challenges. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to talk a bit about hunger now because it costs millions to Africa um, and the social, uh, the social economic impact is alarming. Um, with the establishment of ACE Foods, how are you and your team responding to the issue? So we definitely recognize that there's a hunger and malnutrition challenge on the African continent. This is a burden that we share with many and many other parts of the world. But what is unique about Africa is that Africa should be able to feed itself and the world. You know, we have the world's largest arable land. We have great people, innovations, and there's no reason why we should be in the situation that we currently face. So what Ace Foods has served us as a catalyst, proving that a proudly African company can source locally and produce nutritious food for local markets. We currently source from 10,000 farmers. We have about 20 products in the market, both seasoning, spices, complementary foods, nutritious foods. And what we're proving as a catalyst is that it is possible in our continent to generate nutritious food and to feed our people. Um, and in addition to ACE Foods through Sahel Consulting, I've launched many ecosystem solutions in dairy where we're at unlocking the tremendous potential in the local dairy sector to reduce our importation of dry milk and ensure that we have a yogurt and fresh milk industry across our country, Nigeria. We're working in yam and cassava. 
leveraging innovation in seed systems to leapfrog and in increase the productivity of our farmers. And we've launched businesses in maize and so many other value chains, proving that if we invest in innovation and technology, train our farmers, empower our women, empower our youth, that we can create vibrant value chains that are dynamic and globally competitive. And so it's been an exciting journey. And through all my different hats, Ace Foods, Sahel Consulting and Nourishing Africa, we're actually unlocking the potential in this sector and showing what is possible and getting a lot of young people excited about the opportunities in the sector. Great. I mean, it's, it's fantastic some of the work that you've done. I just wondered what the role of African youth was in the future of agribusiness though across the continent and how digital innovation plays into that. So African youth are truly what get me excited about this sector and about the continent. 70% of our population is under 35. Um, and these young people understand digital technology and innovation. They know how to use it. Um, it they speak the language. Um, and so we're seeing young people entering our space, leveraging ag tech, um, linking farmers to markets, leveraging ag tech to address issues around inputs and distribution of fertilizer and seeds. We also seeing young people getting excited about funding farmers and actually um, engaging. So lots of companies have emerged across the board. Uh, when CTA released the report in 2018, they identified about 400 ag tech innovations that were already being spearheaded by young people across the continent. COVID-19 has actually accelerated that because what we've seen with COVID-19 is that without technology, you can't operate, right? And so we have seen a plethora of young people and accelerators and incubators to support them from Blue Moon in Ethiopia to CC Hub in Nigeria. We're seeing a plethora of accelerators and incubators attracting young people and engaging young people. Through Sahel, we have the Sahel Scholars Program, which we launched in 2017. And what we started doing was going to universities and getting young people excited about agriculture, providing them with internships and scholarships. And this year, we actually had a virtual program for African youth across the continent. And what we were able to see is that so many young people want to enter the sector. They just need mentoring, support, um, funding, and they need partnerships. And so that's what we're doing through our Sahel Scholars Program. And finally, through Nourishing Africa, we launched a digital hub last year called Nourishing Africa. And our vision is a million entrepreneurs who scale ensure that Africa can feed itself, leveraging innovation and technology. But if you go on the Nourishing Africa platform, you just see how many innovations and technologies that young people are leading. We now have entrepreneurs in 35 African countries through Nourishing Africa. And Nourishing Africa is led by two young women who are under 30. Uh, and I'm so excited about the impact that we're having in this ecosystem, sharing knowledge, building a community, enabling the young people to work with each other, linking them up with financing, providing support and experts, and then ensuring that together we can grow the sector. I think it's so important. I mean, some of that stuff that you've just mentioned is so impressive. And I think it's great that conferences like this are changing the narrative um, around Africa. And I know that you're passionate about changing narratives. It's also the name of your, your newest company. What do you think, I mean, aside from this idea that, you know, Africa is poor and it can't feed itself, what other pervasive narratives do you think that you know we need to kind of really wipe away and say you know these are not these are just don't exist and you know what messages do we need to get out there well one of the key things changing narrative africa is doing is celebrating african food you know i go around the world and i ask people what's your favorite dish from africa and they can't think of one um, but if you ask them, what's your favorite dish from Thailand? They may never have to be been to Thailand, but they can list off a whole range. They yeah. know about sushi. They may never have ever been to Japan. The narrative that African food is not featured on the global platform is, for me, a, an atrocity. Africa has some of the best food in the world. We have 54 African countries that have diverse cuisine that's tasty, that's nutritious, that's healthy. And guess what? The world already consumes our cuisine without realizing. So we have contributed to you know, food history. We have already shaped food ecosystems and we are going to 
take back our place on the global food stage. Um, and so my dream is to ensure that we have food on every major grocery stores, in every major e-commerce channel, and that when you go to food hubs, anywhere in the world you see West African food or Ethiopian food, you know, amplified. Um, because food builds bridges, food connects in ways that only music does. And I believe that if the world appreciates our food, um, the world will appreciate us. 70% um, of the world's cocoa comes from Africa. You can't eat a chocolate bar anywhere in the world without tasting a bit of Africa. Sesame, cashews, you know, yams, name, name the value chain, millet, sorghum, fonio, you know, teff. And we have, you know, People tell me, oh, I love rooibos tea. Well, rooibos means the hills of South Africa. You can't love rooibos tea without loving Africa. And so we're changing mindsets by not only sharing about our history and our contributions to the food ecosystem, but our current diverse, amazing gastronomic realities and ensuring that we build bridges, leveraging this. Uh, showcasing our entrepreneurs, their innovations, their cooking methods, and celebrating African food. And so I look forward to working with all of you, especially those who share my passion uh, for food to really showcase what we can offer the world. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I mean, uh, I think this question kind of plays into that because, you know, for decades, Africa has experienced a brain drain. You know, people go away, they train, and then they stay somewhere else. What can be done to encourage highly trained African youth to feel their intellectual potential belongs to the continent? If anyone's watching today, what can you say to them that would entice them back? Well, the first thing I would say is the future is Africa and the future belongs to young Africans. When you think about the population explosion, my city, Lagos, is gonna have 50 million people by 2050. Now, when you see those numbers, you can either be filled with fear or with anticipation for the market opportunities that this creates. These are people who need to eat, they need clothing, they need housing. There's so many opportunities. There are business opportunities on the African continent, right? So that's the first thing. The second is that if we can create jobs, if we can create stable and sustainable jobs, people will stay. People do not leave Ace Foods or Sahel Consulting or Nourishing Africa to travel abroad. They're excited to be here because they're building something, they're earning a livable wage, they're enjoying themselves and they're making a difference in the lives of people. And so I believe all Africans, first, second, third generations can become innovators in our ecosystem, wealth creators and job creators. So join me in this adventure to transform Africa because the future belongs to us. And if not now, when? And if not us, who? It's time for us to change narratives about our continent, but it's also time for us to build those bridges between Africa and the rest of the world and become the innovators that will transform this continent. Mm. You're, a, you're a very successful serial entrepreneur and with the CEO of Africa Philanthropy Forum. You've spoken out quite a bit about the issues associated with Western philanthropy and the need for a more Africa-centered approach. What barriers do you think need to be overcome to achieve this? Bearing in mind that summits like this, you know, are backed by, you know, or founded by Europeans and, and Americans, you know, how can we, um, what, what are the main barriers to, to, to creating more Africa-led projects like this? Apologies, I'm actually a director of the Africa Philanthropy Forum, not the CEO. I'm going to ask <laughs> Sorry. Again. Okay. I want to repeat that. Sorry. Yeah. Um, it wasn't your fault. That was a mistake that I did do. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Um, you're a serial entrepreneur um, and the director of the Africa Philanthropy Forum. And you've previously spoken at length about the issues associated with um, Western philanthropy and the need for a more Africa centered approach. What barriers do you think need to be overcome to achieve this? The first myth we have to change is that Africans are not strategic or philanthropic. Africans are the most generous groups of people and data shows that Africans rally around each other in times of need, in times of joy, and that we do give. And there's obviously the black tax where so many of us are supporting numerous family members and people in our community. What we have to change is the myth that Africans are not philanthropic and that Africans are not strategic. And 
that is something that through our research at the African Philanthropy Forum, through our engagement with either, each other, we're starting to change that narrative. The second thing is really building up local institutions to ensure that our local institutions and our high net worth individuals on the African continent have foundations that are developed with the right systems and structures to ensure perpetuity, right? Sustainability beyond the lifetime of the philanthropist. And these institutions are critical. And then the third piece is that we need local organizations to also strengthen their systems and structures to position themselves to receive funding from our local philanthropists and our global philanthropists. The issue that drives me really, really mad and makes me very upset is when I see a lot of funding from African philanthropists going to Western organizations. And these African philanthropists tell me they can't find a local organization. They don't know where they are. And they exist, they're here. In fact, they're more effective and efficient than the international organizations. They can deliver at much lower budgets, but there's a misconception that we don't have the local organizations or the local organizations are not strong enough. And yes, they need to be strengthened. And philanthropists need to invest in the capacity building of these local organizations and also amplify the voices of these local organizations so that their work is heard and celebrated and recognized. Packaging and branding and storytelling is so critical to funding, right? Funders want to engage with institutions that tell stories, that can craft their stories, that can brand, that can celebrate the successes. And this doesn't happen overnight. So it's, it's gonna take a concerted effort from African philanthropists driving this strategic philanthropy into local organizations and building their capacity. And together we will rise and change these mindsets. At African Philanthropy Forum, we say Africa for Africans. And we believe that we as Africans hold the future of our continent in our own hands. And together we can recreate this future that we all aspire for. A future where every African child grows up in a safe and healthy environment and can fulfill their highest potential on the continent and live a full and meaningful life. We're inching towards that. And with Africans leading the future of their continent, and working collaboratively with other African philanthropists, building local organizations, I think we're gonna start seeing that momentum um, and that narrative change. Fantastic. I'd like to wrap up by asking you a more personal question because you have been a leader now um, of many organizations. And I wanted to ask you what your piece of advice would be for women specifically in the audience today around being a good leader and leadership of big companies and organizations? I have three pieces of advice. The first one is authenticity. You have to know who you are, embrace who you are, and stand in your confident self, being proud of who you are. That authentic voice is so important and the world needs to hear it. Don't lower your standards, or your expectations to fit into anybody else's image of who you are. The second is ask for help. Vulnerability is also a sign of leadership. I have been surrounded by mentors and angels and supporters and family members who helped me. You can't do this alone to ask for help and be vulnerable enough to say, I don't know this or I need help in this area. And the final thing is surround yourself with a community of other women who support you. Together, we're stronger. I've been blessed with communities of women who I have cultivated and who have cultivated me. Um, and it's so important to have sisters and champions and mentors, role models and critics, people who can tell you the truth where you need to step out of line. It's really important to build that community. And if I can add a final one is amplify your voice. The world needs to hear your voice. So write, speak, engage, and amplify that voice. Shape the narrative in your ecosystem. Be seen as that expert because you have so much experience that the world deserves to hear and so much advice and knowledge that the rest of the world will welcome. Please amplify your voice. I look forward to celebrating your successes in years ahead. God bless you. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you so much.